seated. Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Last week we did a Prophecy Update 2018. Last week was New Year's Eve for, for the year 2018. Now we are in 2018. And, I, and last week we covered how close could we be. We, we covered the fact that there's one verse in Hosea that indicates maybe that the coming of Jesus will be 2,000 years after Jesus was crucified. Uh, we then looked at the fact that, well, to get from where we are today to be able to fill, fulfill all the prophecies about global glo- government, global antichrist, all that stuff would mean that things would have to get clicking pretty quick to let all that be fulfilled. And, and then we looked at two wars, Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17, as wars that could occur. The stage is set for the first time in, since those prophecies were written uh, over a couple thousand years ago. Uh, the stage is set for those wars to occur, but they haven't occurred yet. But all the players are there. Everything is ready to go. And maybe it'll be in our not-too-distant future. And then today, uh, we're going to cover a very important concept of the nature of God and how it applies to the rapture of the church. And the most important, I think, sign of when the rapture is going to occur. The most important sign of when the rapture is going to occur, according to the text that we're going to cover today, is when the earth is in total apostasy from the truth. That would be that would go completely coinciding with everything we know about what Scripture has done is when nobody really wants to listen or hear about or believe in our Jesus. Are we getting closer and closer to that in our society and world today? And it's not, this time it's not just one nation and then there's revival over here because, you know, Europe had its great revival and as they started to wane, the revival came to America. And, and then even people have been saying, and while we're waning, it's revival over in China. But I got an email from somebody that's over in China that says that, you know, the younger generation isn't into it. Just like the younger generation isn't into the things of Jesus in our generation. They're not into discipleship. They're not into having an answer for the hope that's within them. They are not going home and sitting down reading their Bibles, unless, you know, unless people know uh, of, of a situation, a pocket somewhere in America where it's really happening. And, and kids say, why do you bring in your phone in here? We're having a Bible study. Uh, why, why are you doing that? Why, put down your game. Come on. You know, all the rest of us are doing a Bible study. We're learning how to share Jesus with our friends and neighbors at school. Is that happening? No, not at all. And so, the bio, and so we're going to see what God does. He, he warns, man turns away from him, and they go into depravity. And then he has people that are trying to preach to them and tell them to stay out of depravity. And when they no longer want to hear, what does he do? He takes them out, and he brings judgment. And so, if Jesus is going to come and take the church before the judgment of the capital T tribulation the last seven years then he's going to wait. He would want to wait. He would want to wait for us to be as effective as long as we can, the remnant church, the people that are holding on to the truth, as long as he can so that our message can go out and God's mercy and grace can fall upon the people that are there. But when he sees that nobody wants to listen, for the most part, he takes us home, and then he lets the world fall into the judgment that we last week said, starts with Jesus ripping the scrolls, the seals of the scroll in Revelation 5 and 6 and bringing the tribulation period onto the world. So, uh, I, think, I think it's the, I think we're in the last days of apostasy. I think we're starting the last days of apostasy. And when it gets bad enough, God's going to take us home. Are you excited about that? I hope so. And what we should be doing, if we were really excited, we would, and we really understood what's going to happen for those left behind, we would be begging and pleading with everybody we know, you need to listen. You need to listen before, because judgment is coming to this world. Genesis 6.1, we see that uh, things had gotten so bad on planet Earth at, shortly after the creation that uh, and Adam and Eve, and they had their children and children's children. Now there's, you know, a lot of people on the earth. But it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, and I'm going to throw out wicked angels here. That's what it's talking about. We don't have time to cover this. Um, but it's talking about wicked angels. 
saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So in those days, there was a demonic influence of where angels cohabitated with women. They had giants. It's a long story. Don't have time. A lot of people, they spend their whole Christian walk right now studying the angels and the fallen angels, the Nephilim, and they're studying about supposedly Antarctica. There's an underground, under ice uh, headquarters of the Nephilim and all this stuff. And I want to encourage you, if you've been deceived by that, is the, the New Testament church never has us be looking for the angels. We're not looking for the angels. What are we looking for? Jesus. We're looking for obeying him. It's a distraction to get our eyes off of the reality. But it is a fact that there, they were back then. And what the demonic angels did is they corrupted the society to the point where it says in verse 5, uh, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God says, I'm going to only give him 120 years. I see how bad it is. It's going to get worse. I'm going to give him 120 years because the thought and intent of their life is evil continually. They're going to all completely self-destruct. The entire world's population will kill itself off. And then he says, but, I, but verse 8, go to verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So God said, okay, no, and then he's going to say, Noah, build a boat. And as soon as you get done building a boat, 120 years, then I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to destroy the world. And I'm going to start over with you and your family, because he was righteous. If we're in the last days before God's second coming, then what we're going to see is wickedness continue to fill the earth. Are we seeing wickedness fill the earth? It's just unbelievable. And, and, and we're, we should be sheltered. You and me, we should be sheltered because we shouldn't be in the drug scene, the porn scene, the, the, the bars across the country that all kinds of depravity are happening in and all this other stuff. We shouldn't be seeing it. But imagine God does see it. He sees all of the abuse that's happening. He sees the child trafficking. He sees every single screaming baby that's being killed in the womb. He sees, he sees the... Planned Parenthood, um, you know, then dealing in, you know, selling the body parts. He sees that our country votes and defends that practice. He sees all the evil that's in the world, and he's just, he's told us, he's given us a boat in this generation too. What's the boat in this generation? It is Jesus. And he's given us the ability to tell people, you better get into the boat, Jesus, because God sees all this, and he sees that the thought and intent of men are becoming evil continually, and if you don't get in the boat, you're going to be part of the judgment that falls upon the earth. And so then we go to verse 13, uh, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms of the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Now, let's turn to Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. Um, so, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Do you think you have found grace in the eyes of God? And, and now see what God did is he, he looked down and he goes, you know, everybody is killing each other, raping each other, or whatever they were doing. And, but I see Noah and his sons, the last family on earth that fears me. I, I'm going to give them grace. He sees the depravity now, and he sees, if you're a true believer, a solid, saved Jesus freak, he sees you, and he says, you know what? But he has grace in my eyes. She has grace in my eyes. And he's not going to bring the judgment upon this world associated with the tribulation period while you're here, because he's going to take us home. Uh, God waited in the days of Noah, prepared an escape. Why? Because no one was willing to join Noah. Now, how do we know that Noah was telling him, join me? Well, because Peter says that he was a preacher of righteousness. Now, we don't know because the Bible doesn't say, but as he's building the ark and hammering and sawing and everything else, I would imagine. Do you, <laughs> is it too much of a stretch to think that the neighborhood showed up to mock him every day? 
Is it too much of a stretch to think that as he's saying, uh, and they're saying, it hasn't ever rained, what are you saying that there's going to be a flood? We haven't even seen a flood. Uh, because God's word, his prophetic word to me that I'm giving to you says, judgment is coming and it's going to be quick and you better get on this boat. No way, I don't want to shovel when you're there supposedly in a supposed flood. And they mocked him. Now, the, the world today mocks those remaining Christians that talk about the judgment of God coming. Do you hear it on, how many of you hear it on Christian TV? If you watch Hal Lindsey, you'll hear it. Besides that, you don't hear it. You know, maybe there's some other ones. Judgment's coming, but it's not being, it's not even being communicated because we're in an apostasy. The church is apostatizing from the warning, the very warnings that God has left us here to do. So now we're going to 18, another judge. And so what we know happened is the flood did come, and it came quickly. One day the crust ruptured, the fountains of the great deep burst up. For the next 150 days, water keeps going higher and higher as the water from under the crust comes and floods the relatively flat earth at the time. Everything that had breath in its nostrils died. The judgment came just as God had told Noah. Everybody that rejected salvation died. Well, there's another judgment, Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. After the flood, you would think that everybody after the flood would pass down to their, to their sons and their grandsons and granddaughters and everything. You'd think, don't ever mess with God's law. Don't ever reject his plan because things go really bad when you do that, you would think. But it doesn't take long for man to not care about that. Genesis 18, 20. Um, God's, Jesus himself has materialized in a human form um, <laughs> in front of Abraham, and he's brought with him two angels that look like men. And they're having a conversation. So Jesus and these two angels are having a conversation with Abraham. Uh, and he says, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that existed at the time that have been destroyed ever since, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men, they looked like men, but we can tell from the context they're angels, turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. So the Lord Jesus, before the manger, stood there, still talking to Abraham, but the angels are on their way down to Sodom and Gomorrah to prepare to destroy it because of the evil and the wickedness that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham came near, verse 23, and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Now, Abraham, God allowed this Abraham tirade to go on so that we could know this fact. No, Jesus does not judge the righteous with the wicked. He will not bring his wrath down, his judgment down upon the righteous with the wicked. And because he goes on to say, so the Lord said, if I find 50, verse 26, if I find 50 righteous within this major city that we now know from archaeological discovery in clay tablets um, from the city of Ebla, that it was a massive city that people were trading with, within the city that then I will spare all the place for their sake. I will let them continue to live in sexual immorality and depravity and debauchery and filthiness. I'll let them live in that. If there's 50 in the city, I won't destroy it. And then Abraham start, keeps working Jesus down and he goes to verse 32 and he says, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went, went, went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Go to Genesis 19, 12. See, again, I'm going to emphasize, God wants us to know that his judgment does not fall on us, his people. After the angels, after the angels they come into the town, and the homosexual mob of men, young and old, all gather to Lot's house at the door, 
because they want to rape these two, what they see as men, but are angels and are unaware what they're taking on. They want them to come out and they say, we want to bring them out here. These are new guys in town. Bring them out. We want to know them carnally, which means they wanted to, rape, they wanted to sodomize them. Um, then the, but the angels blinded all the men at the door. And then this is what they said. This is, then the men, the angels that looked like men, said to Lot, have you anyone else, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whoever are in this city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So, hey, Lot, we know you fear God. We were sent here because you're here to get you out. You need to tell as many people as you can, your family, anybody that you can, because I have to get you out before destruction comes. Is there anybody that you want to warn? Ask yourself the same question. Is there anybody else you want to warn? Things could change so quickly. We're, we're so, there's, as I said last week, and even the week before that for Christmas service, there's so many things that are lining up for when we're in the last days. Do you want to warn anybody? Because we should. Come out of this evil world. Get into the last days Noah's boat. It's called Jesus. Get, get saved. To turn away from the wickedness of this world. Verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up. Get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. And then this is America today. But his sons-in-law, to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. So very important. Apostasy. Complete disregard for the warnings of God. Complete disregard for calling sin, sin. Complete disregard for anything that, any warning from God, it seems like you're, are you joking? There's going to be a rapture of the church. There's going to be the second coming. There's going to be global government, a global antichrist. The world's going to say, we want global government to save war, but we get a global antichrist that becomes a global Hitler and destroys almost everybody on the face of the earth. And, and your Bible says that, and you really think that's going to happen? Oh, you guys just, you see, you're joking. You're psycho. Well, it's happened before. It's happening again because the apostasy is upon us. Um, even Lot's wife apostatized because he grabs his wife, his son-in-laws don't want to go, he grabs his two girls that are so corrupted by the world around her that as soon as they think that the world's been destroyed when they see Sodom and Gomorrah you know, burning, they get their, their dad drunk and then have incestuous relationships with him to be able to give us the Moabites and the Ammonites that then for the rest of the centuries created problems for the nation of Israel. So that's how, I mean, see, God spared them, and they were so corrupt, they were almost completely gone anyway. Now, sometimes, it, isn't it good to know, God will rescue the church even though, you know, we're kind of corrupt too, don't you think, at times? Are we getting a little bit too much into the world than we, than we should be? Are we letting more of the world be in our minds than we should be? But let's not be as bad as Lot's daughters being completely, oh, let's go get drunk, let's go have an incestuous sexual relationship, let's go do this stuff and let's go do that stuff. We shouldn't be like that. They got rescued, but Lot's wife, she's, oh, I'm gonna miss the party tonight. And he, she turns back and God says, enough, turns her into a pillar of salt, she's not saved. Apostasy. Go to verse 20. See now, the city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one, please let me escape there. It is not a little one. Is it, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, the angel said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there. So important, for I cannot, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Why? Because God doesn't, he doesn't bomb his children. He doesn't bring judgment on his people. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zoar. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. So I'm saying God's judgment cannot come on God's people according to his promises. Now, some would say, well, what about when 
I mean, God brought Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, as a clear prophetic judgment on the Jews in Jerusalem and Israel when they were in so much sin, and Jeremiah and Isaiah, they prophesied to them, they rejected, they went into idol worship, and God brought them, brought Nebuchadnezzar. But if you read very carefully your Bible when you're going through the Bible this year, pay attention, because Jeremiah said, if you escape to the Babylonians, you will live. If you stay here and listen to the scribes and Pharisees and the, and the, and the uh, zealots who are saying that God is going to not let the temple to be destroyed, he's going to give us victory over the Babylonians. If you stay, you die. If you desert and go to the Babylonians, you live. And the ones and a bunch left, and they were spared. So see, even when God uses the Antichrist, <laughs> look at the Antichrist. In the, in the book of Revelation, what does he tell the Jews who are living into the tribulation because they rejected Jesus? What, is the, what does he tell them when the Antichrist comes as judgment against the people of the Jews, which now God is dealing with when the church is gone? He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then you need to get down from your house. You need to flee immediately to the wilderness. You must get out of Jerusalem immediately or you will die. And so then, and then, so, God warned his Jews how to get away. The Antichrist tries to destroy them. Revelation chapter 12, God protects those Jews from destruction by the Antichrist. And then you can ask the question, as people who think the church is going to go through the tribulation period, even though Revelation talks nothing about the church after Revelation 3, that there's not a single word about the church after Revelation 3. And it's all about Jews. It's 144,000 Jews. It's about the Jews rebuilding their temple. It's the Jews having sacrifice, something the church doesn't even do. It's about the Antichrist coming after the Jews. The Jews, it's all, it's all the Jews. And so if God is telling his children how to avoid the Antichrist, and the church is there, then my, I have a question. Jesus, what about us? What, what about me living in Port Orchard? What about me living here or there or where? What are we supposed to do? And you know what the answer from Jesus is? Clear in the scripture to me, maybe not to others. I don't need to tell you. You're gone. I've taken you home to be with me. I don't do anything unless I warn by the prophets, Amos says. And the prophets are silent about what we, the church, are supposed to do during the tribulation period. Why? Because we're not there in the tribulation period. So, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, it, G, Peter makes it clear Jesus does not judge his own people. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, those angels who cohabitated with women that were thrown into hell, but cast them down to hell, the word there is to Taurus. It's the deepest, darkest hell. It's a spiritual holding place for de demonic angels that are no longer allowed to mess with us. So there's some of the demons that fell with Satan that are locked up to this day. They're locked up because of what they did in the days of Noah and afterwards. And delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. And there we have from God himself through the prophet or through the apostle Peter telling us he preached. Uh, Noah was preaching. He was, there were eight people alive when the flood was over. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them to destruction. Now pay attention to this. Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Oh, guess what? Is the world listening to the example? See, God, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the homosexual um, epidemic that was governing those cities, he says right here, to be an example to anybody who thinks they should repeat it. Why? So that we wouldn't repeat it, because we wouldn't want judgment. And, of course, that's not taken place. Showing, and I'm going to say showing that we're rapidly approaching the last days, because it's not just here in America. It's, it's worse in Europe. It's worse in Australia. And here we have a baker's who, you know, down in Oregon just a couple weeks ago, the appellate court of Oregon said to the baker, said, I don't want to make a lesbian cake. 
It's a lesbian wedding cake. And the appellate court says, nope, you've got to pay $135,000 for offending the people you would make the cake for. And again, me saying this in our society brings derision to show how apostate we are, the apostasy that's upon us. And I would say that even if I could gather up the whole American church and listen to it and said how many of people were offended by that, a good percentage would hold up their hand and say that offended me. To say the truth about what God's word says in the, t- in the text of Genesis and even here from the apostle Peter, and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And you know what? Praise God that those bakers were tormented in their soul because they showed themselves to be like Lot. Tormented to live in this society where I have, I mean, I'm just, and by the way, filthy conduct. Oppressed by the filth. You can't get more of a filthy conduct than the homosexual lifestyle. And, and that's always left out. It's always left out, but just think, and not very long because it's too disgusting, but just think, and that's what God calls the filthy lifestyle. Um, you know, back with, you know, this is what they said to Lot when they're wanting to come and rape the angels that are there, and he's saying, no, 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 you know, don't come. These men are in my house. Do not and then, and then they turn on him. They allowed him to be there at the city gate because he was probably a smart businessman or whatever. And then this is what they said. This one, verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 9 of Genesis, this one came in to stay here. He left Abraham up on the hill and came down to the valley. And he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with him than with them. Well, we're going to kill him. We're going to rape him and kill him. Uh, so they pressed hard against the man lot and came near to break down the door, and that's when the angels delivered him. So, so see, the world's going to get that way towards us. They look at us as judging them. We're not judging them. We're saying, God's judgment's going to fall. Get onto the boat, Jesus. You've got to turn and repent from your sin. You have to agree with his law. You have to turn away from the homosexual lifestyle. You have to, you have to turn away from embracing what God calls evil and abomination. You must embrace what his law says, which is good, and it's good for us, too. And then they say, oh, we're going we're gonna to kill you. Verse 9 of 2 Peter 2. Then the Lord knows how to, okay. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Um, His judgment is going to come upon this lustful, sensuous, filthy practice world. Do you want to be part of the judgment? Everybody everybody here, whether you came as a believer or not, you should all be sitting there, no, why should I? Um, And he knows how to deliver the godly. Are you godly? To be godly means that you have surrendered your life to him. You agree with him. You want Jesus to forgive you for your own ungodliness and filthiness and sinfulness. As Mike said during communion, as I'll say myself, I'm not very far behind Paul either. But, but what happened is people told me back when the church was not apostate, and by the way, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, when the church was not apostate, they were telling me, Kevin, you've got to turn away from sin. You've got to, you cannot get your way to Jesus, to God. You cannot work your way. You're a reincarnationist. You think through many thousands of lifetimes you'll learn how to be a good person and you're going to go be God. The Bible says you're wrong. You must turn away from that false idea of what it takes to be right with God. You must come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? I listen and I say, God, I repent. I repent from this foolishness. I want you to be the Lord of my life. That's what it takes when the apost- you know, before the church apostatized, that's what they used to say. And you know what? I don't want to apostatize, so I'm going to tell you the same thing. That's what you got to do. And, and again, most of you, all of you, I don't know, God knows, are Christians. And I'm, I'm encouraging you to not apostatize and not change from that message and to keep that message just as Lot was, just as Noah was, 
despite what's going around you, despite what they mock you and scorn you, and if they want to kill you, just keep that message because that's why God is leaving us here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who will judge the living and the dead and is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, and because they have itching ears, they will heap unto themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful, underline watchful. It's all over the Bible. Watch, 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 watch. Listen to what God has said. Read what God has said. Watch how that's not what happens in the world. And you watch and you say, no, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to go. You know, in this, in this dangerous world, people are being encouraged, young ladies and women are being encouraged, don't just walk out to your car. Don't just park. You know, wherever the parking spots are easy, where no one, you know, no bang my car. Uh, park where the light is. Park where it's closed so that when you walk out, you're not going to have a, a Noah thought and intense of men's heart or evil continually experience. And so wise people that will sit there and go, watch. Is there anybody there? Is there, am I walking? And God wants us to do that spiritually. We're walking in a spiritually depraved world. And we are supposed to be watching and not being turned aside by fables. We're supposed to hold on to the truth. We're not we're supposed to go after our own desires. I, I'm not supposed to turn my ears away from the truth of God's word and accept the, the teachings of the world and its depravity as a Christian. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And, and Jesus himself, we're going to see that Jesus himself says, guess who gets to escape the judgment coming on the earth according to Jesus, those who watch. Those who are watching and staying sober are going to escape. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.1, this is a very important. I'm going to try and make it clear. It's, it's a difficult passage. I spent a whole Sunday on this section of Scripture, but we're not going to have the time to do it to that detail. But hopefully I'll be able to help you. Chapter 2, verse 1. And by the way, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 had Paul teaching about how Christians are going to be taken off of the planet instantly in just a flash of time, going to be taken to go meet God in the air. So they already have that letter, and he's writing this letter, 2 Thessalonians. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to say the events associated with the second coming to earth, and our, and our gathering together to him, what he had already taught him in the first letter to the Thessalonians, that we're going to be gathered to Jesus to go be caught up together to be with him in the air. So he's talking two subjects. I'm going to tell you two things. You're, you're confused about two things because of some letters that you've received that purport to be from us. So people were forging the Apostle Paul or Barnabas or Silas or whoever, and, and saying, this is the prophecy from God and forging it as being from Paul or Silas or somebody. And he says, I don't want you. I, I want to write about these two subjects that you have been falsely taught about. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. So some, some people had told this church, the day of Christ has come. Now, I'm going to say it couldn't possibly have been a teaching that Jesus has returned to earth. Why? Because they would know it. How would they know it? Well, because the Bible is very clear. What happens is all of Israel is saved. They all look on him whom they have pierced. He comes and sets up his kingdom. The whole world's been destroyed. See, they don't need revelation to know that. What do, they, what, do, what do these Christians in Thessalonica know? Paul's been teaching them out of the Bible. As we covered on Christmas service, Daniel chapter 9 tells them about an antichrist. Daniel 7 and, and 2 talk about the 10-nation world empire that would rule. Uh, Daniel 7 says that that last empire, that last 
of, of the four empires that would try and rule the world, that last ten nation empire is ruled by an antichrist that's given power over the saints to destroy them and to, and to do unimaginable damage to the earth. They know that from Daniel. They know it from Daniel 9. They know, they know from Daniel that the Antichrist is going to put an end to sacrifice in the temple. And they have all this other information. They have Jesus. Jesus told them when his disciples asked him, you know, Jesus, isn't that temple impressive? And Jesus says, it's all going to be destroyed. And they said, when? When is that going to happen? What's the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus told them, as we're going to read here in a minute, you can escape these things. He answered, what, these are all the things that are the sign of my coming, which is what Paul, Paul is saying here, brethren, about the coming of our Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse. Mark 13, three of the apostles recorded what Jesus said, and Jesus gets done saying all these horrible things, the Antichrist, the global government, the, the, cha the Antichrist chasing the Jews, and he says, and you can escape all this if you watch and hold on to the truth until the end. So Paul's been able to teach them all that. They know all that from Scripture. But all of a sudden, this letter comes in and shakes them up. Now they're troubled. How could they be troubled? Well, they can't be troubled because Jesus has actually physically returned because they, they would say, that can't happen. Here's what I think, don't know, this is what I think they were troubled by. You know, that 10-nation world empire, it really means Rome. You, need, you know, the coming Antichrist is going to defile the temple, it really means Caesar Nero. You know that... Um, you know, the different tribulations that are coming, it's really right here, right now. And by the way, that's the eschatology of the Catholic Church to this day. It's the eschatology of people like Cain Canegraaff, partial preterists, and preterists today. They think all of Daniel and Zechariah and all that stuff was all fulfilled back in the time of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And they say that we're living now in the church age. Jesus has come. He has returned to earth in you, in the church. We're, we're the second coming of Christ. It's possible the same lie happened right here. And so then they're sitting there going, wait a second, Paul told us that when this stuff was gonna happen that we would be avoiding it, that Jesus told us we would avoid it. Jesus said we wouldn't be here for the Antichrist. Paul said we weren't gonna be here for the Antichrist. And, and now this letter says this whole Roman thing is the fulfillment of Daniel 7, Daniel 9, all this other, Daniel 12, all this stuff that's happening, and we're not gone. That would be troubling to you, wouldn't it? Let me tell you, see, again, there's great debate about the rapture. There's people that teach that we're gonna be staying here throughout the tribulation period. I think they're wrong. I think it's actually part of the deception that's in the world today, getting people's eyes off. See, as soon as I think I have to stare down the Antichrist, my eyes are on the Antichrist. When the Antichrist is gonna come, everything else. But see, the New Testament church was always thinking Jesus, they were thinking he could come in their time. And see, what's bothering them is they're seeing these events that they're supposed to be gone for. I'm going to be troubled if the Jews build a third temple and we're into the time where, G where the Antichrist goes in and declares himself to be God to the world and then starts databasing everybody and saying, you have to now worship me as the Antichrist. If I'm still here, I'm going to be very troubled that I mistaught you and myself. But you know what? Again, as we finish these verses... I, I really miss some very clear sections of Scripture, if that's the case. So, um, so they, they know a whole lot from the Old Testament prophecies. We ask you, again, verse, the end of verse 1, not to be soon shaken or troubled by either spirit or by word or letter, as if from us, that the day of Christ had come. They are troubled because they have not been gathered to go be with Jesus in the air. These people are saying that you're into the trib and you're not in the presence of God. Uh, let, not, let no one deceive you by any means, as people are being deceived today, for that day, the events leading up to the second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now that falling away verse, you know what, it, you know what the root word of it is? Where we get our word, apostasy. So in other words, God, Jesus, Paul is saying, Jesus is saying through Paul, don't worry, apostasy has to come first. Now, 
And so that was his big preaching. That's why I'm emphasizing it today. Apostasy has to come before the last judgment of the world. Now, was apostasy prevalent in the days of Paul? Not at all. Because what was happening to Christianity? It was exploding. Biblical Christianity was exploding. What did the critics of Paul say? You have shaken, you have turned the world upside down with your doctrine. It was spreading like crazy. And it was going to continue to spread even though Caesar was killing them. And by the way, if you read First and Second Thessalonians, as soon as Paul went into town and shared with them about the gospel of Jesus and they readily embraced it by large numbers and he left, guess what happened? Persecution came on them. They're not troubled that they're being persecuted. They're troubled that they're, that they're in the tribulation period according to the letters. The, the, the Christians were never troubled by being persecuted. They weren't troubled by being crucified. They weren't troubled by being painted in tar and hung up on a pole and burned in Nero's garden for his chariot races. They were troubled to think that something that God himself had promised them they wouldn't see, they were seeing. Uh, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. There's only two times in the scripture that it uses this word apostasy in the Greek. And the other time is when Paul comes in Acts 21:21. 21, 21, he comes to the church. And James is part of the church there. He's still kind of stuck on the temple worship stuff. And Paul comes in town. James goes, you know, James says, but they have been informed, the church here in Jerusalem has been informed, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake, and that word forsake is apostatize. You, you've apostatized Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. Now, is that true? Did Paul say, don't get circumcised anymore? Yes, he did. He, uh, it's okay to apostatize from the ceremonial and priesthood laws of Moses because the Bible said that that was all going to be changed by the Messiah. Is it okay for us to apostatize away from telling people they need to believe in Jesus as the only way, the truth, and the life? No. The Bible doesn't say, in the last days, because people want to say that all religions are of equal value and we've all got to say kumbaya together and we've got to just get along as a nice world government, that you need to stop saying Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. Is that okay to apostatize from that? No. But it's accurate. Paul apostatized from the Jewish teachings of the law because it was replaced by the new covenant of Jesus as our Savior. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless there is a falling away. Apostasy comes first, and, and the man of sin is revealed. So there's an apostasy before the Antichrist is revealed. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God. This is where we know he's going to go and defile the temple in Jerusalem. We also have it implied in Daniel. Showing himself that he is God. Do you, do you not remember that when I was with, still with you, I told you these things? Why are you listening to this letter saying we're there? I told you there's going to be an apostasy. Someday into the future, there's going to be a great apostasy that is going to pray, be a prelude to the unveiling of the future Antichrist. Nero's not the Antichrist. We are not in the apostasy right now. The church is exploding, and it's going to be a church age. You are, didn't I tell you these things? Um, if Paul had taught them that they're going to go through the tribulation period, and, and so, oh, Nero's the Antichrist, the Rome is somehow the ten-nation empire, even though it's only one nation, we're going to fuddle the prophecies and say it's, somehow it's the ten-nation and everything. If you were a Christian in Thessalonica, what would, you, would you have been troubled by that? I wouldn't have been troubled at all. Oh, good, Jesus is coming back. Because they would know. They would know from the prophecy. They have less than seven years. Why am I troubled? I'm not troubled that they're already beating me for Paul coming into town and leading me to Jesus. So what, why would I be troubled if while they're beating me, I also know Jesus is coming back really soon? So, but if Paul taught them that the church is to be rescued and gathered together to Jesus before the Antichrist comes, then I would have been troubled because then I'd be thinking, well, I missed it. Some, 
Somebody was more spiritual and righteous than me, and they made it, but I didn't. I would be troubled to think I got left behind. Let no one deceive you by any means. It will it, apostasy. Don't you remember I told you these things? Now, let, let's go back and review a little bit. Was there apostasy in the days of Noah? Yes. Nobody wanted to hear the truth. Days of Noah, nobody wanted to hear the truth. Apostasy, what happened after that? Judgment. Was there apostasy in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah? Absolutely, totally, didn't want to listen to Lot, didn't care about God, didn't care about their ancestor telling them that God came and judged the world in a flood. They didn't care about what God said about anything. They wanted to go live for the lusts and pleasures of the world. Uh, was there apostasy then? Yes, what happened? Judgment. Was there apostasy in the 1970s when second coming of Jesus was on everybody's lips, that it's imminent, he's coming back, the king, everything. Was, it, was there apostasy? No, it was one of the greatest revivals in American history. And I shouldn't have been believing him. I should have been saying, no, there has to be an apostasy first. Have you not read what Paul taught? It can't be right now. There has to be, this revival has to be replaced by apostasy. And 50 years later, 40 years later, here it is. And it's getting worse, and there's no turning it around. Because I found, uh, I have found it is so hard to talk to people's souls to get down deep like we used to be able to do. Because what would happen, you would have a, a conversation with them about Jesus and on the workplace or meeting them in the street or whatever you did, and what they would do is they would walk away and they would have to ponder that all day long until they got home and turned on the TV. And now what happens? They walk away, they go like this, and what text did I get while that moron was talking to me? And, and they're instantly back into their other world. And there's no recovering it. It's like everybody is so shallow thinking. There is, there is nothing meaningful that is happening in conversations today. And it is only going to escalate, and people have cell phones in South Sudan, a third world country, till a few years ago. The first time I go there, there's not even electricity at all. The last time I go there, everybody has a cell phone. Everybody is starting to do this. It's everywhere. It's done. Um, so there is apostasy now. I have an article, Roger Oakland, Commentary of the Week. I mentioned last week the Jedi religion. Jedi religion, much like others, Rabbi concludes, World Net Daily, December 30th, 2017, a week ago, a little over a week ago, ran an article. <laughs> There's 400,000 Jedis in the United Kingdom. Do you know, to find a Bible-believing, preaching church in London or in, in England is almost impossible. Used to be the bastion of Christian orthodoxy and spreading of evangelists throughout the world, but you got 400,000 Jedis and you got 53,000 in New Zealand, 70,000 in Australia, 55,000 in Canada, and you've got it now as a 501c3 tax-free Jedi religion in America today that can say we're, we're going to meet and play with our lightsabers and, and we get to do so tax-free. And, and all the time mocking Jesus, who rose from the grave, died for our sins. Um, what restrained God's judge? Oh, oh, so then we've uh, Th Second Thessalonians chapter two verse five. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I told these things, and now you know what is restraining that He, the Antichrist, may be revealed in His time. What was restraining God's judgment in Noah's day? The fact that the boat wasn't built. That was what was straining. What restrained God's judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah? That Lot hadn't gotten out of town along with whoever wanted to believe. What's restraining God's judgment in the coming days? You. That's what's restraining God's judgment. And let's see Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And again, this is Jesus himself. Somebody was telling me the other day, you know, the rapture of the church, it wasn't invented until the 1800s by a guy named Darby. No, nobody believed it before then. And I countered with, oh, I, I thought Jesus believed it, Peter believed it, John believed it. You know, it. No, it didn't get invented in the last days. Listen to Jesus. Jesus, after he explains everything that's going to be the tribulation period, the horrors that happen before he returns, he says, but take heed to yourselves. And oh, underline this, 
lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Because if you get into all that, you're going to apostatize. You're going to not think about Jesus coming back. And when he does come, it's going to be unexpected. You're going to be left behind because you weren't really his. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of how big of the world? The whole world. Should the people have been, of Thessalonica have been deceived by a letter that Rome is it? No, because the Bible says the entire world. Daniel chapter 7 said and 8, the entire world. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy. Uh, by the way, how are you counted worthy? By how much you give in the plate? Uh, no. How many times you come to church? No. Read through your Bible in a year like Kevin, always big deals? No. How are you, how are you counted worthy? Because you're washed in the blood of Jesus because you got on your knees before him and you said, God, forgive me, a sinner. Counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to, and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus himself promised if you're worthy, truly saved, not carousing, therefore not carousing, living in the world, because if you're living in the world, you're not really saved. And, uh, and that he says, watch, because it's going to come, and I'm going to take you to be with me. You're going to stand in the presence with me and be spared of what's happening down here on earth. Ran into somebody this week, haven't seen him for a long time. How's your walk with Jesus? Oh, really good. And as he said it, I just about bowled over with marijuana. And by, uh, tragically, I do know what marijuana smells like <laughs> in my pagan days. And, and so right, my mind's thinking, he's lying to me. His walk with Jesus. Oh, by the way, your walk is not right with Jesus when you're high on marijuana, okay? It's just, that's just a simple little truth. Uh, and it got worse from there. He started telling me all this other stuff. I'm gonna, basically, I've been trying to... I've been thinking of others, and now I'm going to start thinking about myself. That's what marijuana will do to you. It'll tell you instead of thinking about Jesus, his law, his word, and other people, it'll, it'll, it's from the devil, Satan. It'll psych your brain up into just thinking about yourself and doing the most foolish things. So as he walked away, and I, I made sure I go, now, wait a second, I'm Fred Meyer. Maybe they have some marijuana stands here for you to purge. Oh, no, no, you can't, you can't do that yet. So... So, no, that, no, I think it was him. I got a little closer. Yep, man, he's, man, reeking. And so as I was walking away and a bunch of people there, I said, hey, you know what? Stay off the marijuana. It'll kill you. And I didn't mean physically. And, that's what, and, and I just said what Jesus said. Jesus said, lest you be left behind to be into drunken carousing. I said, I hope. Everybody's set free from this immoral world that we're in on these big issues. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I want you to go back and read, as you're turning to, to 1 Thessalonians 4.13, I want you to see Jesus himself promises the, the faithful church of the last days in Revelation 3. He promises the faithful church, you have little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. And this is my marching orders, by the way, as your pastor. I want to keep his name. What is his name? Yeshua. You know what Yeshua means? God's salvation. I want to keep saying Jesus is the only way to be saved. He is the way God has allowed man to be saved from sin. I'm going to say it till I die. And I want to say, and have not denied, you know, kept my word, have not denied my, this Bible will be what we teach out of here. It's not going to be Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, not going to be anybody else's book or anything else. It's going to be the Word of God. I've kept His Word because, why? Because, He says, because you do these things, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. I, call me a wimp again, I don't want to be here. And Jesus promises me not Darby in the 1800s, Jesus promised me I don't have to be here if I keep his name and keep his word in my heart until he comes. He's going to keep me from the hour of trial upon this earth. 
So, and I hope you do too. And then we're going to close with 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through. Because this, again, is what Paul had written them before he wrote 2 Thessalonians. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who had died before them, but Christians don't really die. They only fall asleep because they're alive and with God as soon as they do. Their souls are. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus, Yeshua, God's salvation, sent by God, Messiah, died for our sins and rose again to prove he has life, to give us life, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. God is not going to leave these. Yeah. See, again, the New Testament church was, oh, they died before Jesus came to take us home. Now, is that imminency? See, people say, oh, there was, no Im- there was no belief in the early church of the imminency of Jesus' return. Uh, excuse me, but 1 Thessalonians 4, they were worried that somehow they died before he got, he takes them to be with him. Um, for, this, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So Paul is teaching them there's going to be a time, and they were thinking it could have been in their generation, that there's going to be a trump, they're going to be just blasted up to be with Jesus. Now, if you read the second coming of Jesus' Old Testament prophecies pertaining to the Jewish nation, Jesus is coming to earth, and that's what the, the post-tribbers, the people who reject the rapture, they say that Jesus is going to come to earth, and then he's going to gather the elect, and that's the rapture. No, he's gathering the survivors on earth to Jerusalem for his heavenly kingdom. We have already gone to be with him because it says that we come back with him. So, caught up, and, and by the way, people, if anybody says to you, oh, you believe in the rapture, your stupid pastor has deceived you, because you, the rapture, just show me a verse in the Bible that says rapture. Just taken to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and that word rapture is harpazo in the Greek, and it means to violently snatch away. It means to take you. So, excuse me for not saying harpazo, instead of rapture, but the rapture is understood to be violently taken up, that Jesus is just going to just zap us right into his presence. You know when else it was used? It was used when Philip got done baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? He witnesses to them, and he baptizes them, and he comes up out of the water, and what does the Scripture say? The Scripture says the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. Caught caught Philip away. You know what that is? Harpazo. Violently snatched him, disappeared him out of the place and put him up in Caesarea. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says that I was caught up to the third heaven. Paul was saying, I was taken up to heaven. The same word. I was, we're going to be caught up, raptured to heaven, to be with God, to meet him in the air and forever be with him. From then on, the scriptures are extremely clear. And the same thing you can see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. So, two important things. One, Jesus is coming back someday. Two, he's coming back for those who love him, for those who have, have put their trust in him as their Savior. And if we live long enough into the last of the last days, he's going to take us before the Antichrist shows up because we have to be gone because we're restraining the revealing of the Antichrist and the coming uh, desolations that are going to be a result of him. And that's a comforting thing to be comforted but with that word that we're not going to have to be here for that. And, and we don't want to apostatize, and I don't want to be too troubled by seeing it all around me. It should just instead put a fervor on me to not go there and to try and do what Jesus told me to do until he comes to take us, because it's a sign that the storm clouds of judgment are soon upon this world, and we grieve for those that are going to be left behind because they do not trust in Jesus as their Savior. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Is your name in all the earth?